Um, hi, everyone. So thank you very much for having me. Um, and thank you to the FAST uh, team for, for having me. So um, I was told to talk about sales to startups. And so the, the, this is a presentation, a version of presentation I've done before, um, but hopefully it'll be interesting and helpful for you because sales is, is very critical. Uh, and so, you know, before, you know, before so I get started, um, you know, just a bit about my background, I uh, was a partner of five minute startup. So I spent six years there, um, invested in a lot of uh, 400, 414 pre-seed and seed um, companies. And I also mentored a lot of different startup accelerators. Um, you know, I sit on the board and advisory board of several companies. And, you know, prior to 500, I was actually an operator. So I spent 10 and a half years as executive at Yahoo. And prior to that, I worked at a uh, early stage startup that raised about over $60 million. Actually, I went and looked, at, looked it up. It was like actually $65 million, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, and so I ran marketing for them. I ran online marketing uh, at the startup back in 99, 2000. Um, and so I have, um, I have both um, the startup experience as well as big company experience as well as, um, as, as, well as investment experience. Um, so I actually come from, from a very, very different angle, uh, partly because of the fact that I, you know, I started off in marketing, but actually I built my career um, you know, at Yahoo doing, doing sales actually. So I ran and built several sales teams over there. And so sales is actually near and dear to my heart um, and found that that sales was actually probably one of the most like undervalued, in my opinion, very, very undervalued um, assets of a, of a company. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is unfortunately sort of like the popular view of sales, right? If you haven't seen this movie called Glenn Gary, Gary, Glenn Ross, great movie, but it's a very Hollywood exaggerated view um, and very negative view of sales, right? It's just like these people who are like, just like trying to stuff stuff down people's throats of just like stuff that people do not want, right? And that, that's actually not really what sales was. That was actually my view. Sales in the US, I think sales across the world it's actually seen as a very negative thing. And I learned this um, when I was at Yahoo. What I realized was like, well, actually sales is actually done very differently. Like good sales, you know, like a really good salesperson and really, really good sales organizations. Like it's actually not about going and finding things, like getting something and trying to just like push this thing down somebody's throat that they don't need. That's actually not what sales is. Sales is actually trying to understand who your customer is, then trying to understand what you know, sort of their needs are, and then trying to understand if your product or your service is actually the right thing for what they're trying to do. And if it's not, you move on, you find something else, right? Um, and so sales is, is sort of like, is very nuanced. Um, and so I actually think sales when it's done right is actually a pretty honorable thing to do. And the best salespeople are actually like, it's not about like stuffing something down their throat. It's actually about finding out what your customer needs and, and seeing if, if what you have it can be fit toward that. Um, and actually sales is actually really important. So for many of you who are, are founders, um, you know, sales actually probably takes up 70% of your time and selling is not necessarily just selling sort of like your product, even though that's a big part of it, you know, like they're selling to customers and right, that's one big part, but also hiring new employees that's selling, right? You're selling an idea, trying to raise money from investors. You're selling sort of like what your, your, your company does, the vision, right? You know, to the press, um, that's selling and and even potentially down the road from an exit perspective, you're trying to sell your company um, that that sales right so it's actually a pretty big part of your of your world in your life. Um, if you're if you're a founder, um, and so any founder that actually doesn't want to do sales i'm just like then you shouldn't be a founder that's actually a really, really big part of your life um, and big part of your role. Um, and so, you know, before you, before you actually go in and sort of do sales, there's, there's a lot of things you, before you actually go out and start talking to customers, there's actually quite a lot of homework you have to do. So Ben Franklin, great American, he talked about this, he had this quote, it's like, fail to plan and plan to fail. And so before you go out there, you actually have to do quite a lot of homework. And so let's, let's talk about a bunch of things you need to do. Um, there's this great book called Positioning. It's an old book, um, came out in the eighties. I think maybe even the seventies um, and this idea, just like you think about all, you know, human beings, like we're all super, super busy. There's lots of things going on in our lives. And, and so what happens is just like, everything's just really a fight to sort of like get into their mind, right? Literally the battle for your mind. And so I use this example of just when I go and, and talk about Coke or, or like, um, or I talk about like soda, right? Like, you know, like pop, 
um, you know, like what's the first thing that comes to mind? It's actually Coca-Cola, right? Like just like next thing is actually Pepsi and you probably don't remember anything else. And so this idea of just like for every product category, there's, you know, people only remember one or two things. They can't remember more than that. Um, and so it's just actually understanding sort of like where you sit in the consumer's mind. And it's a startup is usually you don't sit in their mind at all. And so it's like, how do you figure out where your position is in somebody's brain, right? In your customer's brain. Um, so just understanding that and, and reading this book is actually helpful to understand that um, and learning to tell your story. And so I use this example all the time of like Pixar of like why Pixar movies are so well done. And I think one of the big parts is actually the storytelling aspect of it, you know, like if you think about the actual time they actually spend in sort of like making the story versus sort of like the animation, the animation is actually a very, very small part. The animation is maybe 10, 20% of the time they spend in making a movie. Most of it's actually in figuring the storyline, right? The characters and storyline. And you as a founder and as a storyteller have to think very, very clearly about what your story is. Um, because stories are actually really powerful. Stories are actually well-known shortcuts from a sales perspective, well-known shortcuts from a fundraising perspective. You know, there's actually been real research and studies showing that actually from, from storytelling, like what, what you, you're taught in school, which is almost always wrong, is like just like you just have to show all the facts, right? I mean, the facts are important, but actually the real important thing is how you integrate the facts into a storyline because, you know, human beings are very, very much wired to absorb information better, right? Like, why do you remember fiction more than sort of like nonfiction books? Most of the time it's because of the storytelling aspect of it, right? And the characters and storytelling. And so it's a, it's a shortcut to people's brains. You know, I, I would say in general, we are not wired very, very well to sort of like if you just hammer people with facts all the time, we don't take that in. And, and this is something that I think that that school has actually done us a very, very big disservice. Um, and so there actually have been studies about the importance of actually stories. Um, and so you should learn how to storytell. Um, and then the other part is really the sales pitch, right? Like the very, very simplified sales pitch. And, and one of the things is just about keeping it very, very simple and using this of like, we are this company, we help, you know, like, do this, you know, for this type of customer by what is a speciality, right? Um, and I'll, you'll have this deck later on, so you can take a look at it. But sometimes just keep it very, very simple, helps you clarify this idea and your value proposition for the customer. Um, next thing you have to understand is what your competition is, right? And the competition could be direct competition, could be indirect competition, but actually just by understanding this, it's just like, how do you position yourself against your competition, how you talk about them, right? And, and then more importantly, why are you different and why are you better, right? The differentiation piece of just like, you know, this is a competition, understanding what they do. This is what we do. That's sort of like unique and actually just 10 times better than, than what the competitive, you, what your competitors are actually doing. And that's actually really important. Knowing what your product is, that's very basic, but actually knowing the nuances of your product, which ties into the competitive landscape. Um, knowing who your customers are, um, this is really, really basic, but my view is just like, in, I think this is agritech, right? So let's say you're selling to farmers, but I actually think it's not just selling to farmers. It's like, what is the, the unique specific group of farmers that you're actually targeting? Um, and the more narrow in the beginning, actually, the more important it is. Um, you know, like, like what is like the, what they call like, uh, the average, um, order value, right. Or the average sort of like customer value, just like understanding the size of the customer, right. And how much they can potentially spend and give you is actually important too. Um, and knowing sort of like, based on that, that will also help you understand what's the best way to reach them, right? Like, is it through online marketing? Is it through B2B sort of like having a sales force? It's through telesales, it's through shops, by understanding these things, this is all the homework that you need to understand. Um, and, and understand that with every new market you go into, with every new customer segment, you almost have to think about this as starting from scratch, right? And so let's go through a live example. Um, you know, somebody selling chickens, right? You know, in the beginning, it's actually about, and I don't know the stage of the company that you're in right now, but understanding sort of like, what's the idea, right? Like, you know, so there's the idea stage, 
And then one sort of like trying, next part is just like building sort of what the MVP is, right? Um, you know, what are the right features you sort of building toward once you understand all these things I mentioned to you earlier, once you launch, like how much should you charge for it, right? And maybe in the beginning, you, it might actually have to be free just to get people to use it. My preference is you try to charge something for it uh, because that's actually an indication of actually interest too. Um, and the next thing is just like, once you get it to a bunch of customers, then how do you actually build this up to sort of like sell and build an organization to sell to and service a large, large group of customers. And so in the beginning, before you even hire salespeople, I actually think it's very important to sort of like think about the fact that you should be the first person is actually yourself, right? As a founder. And it's really, really important that you're doing sales yourself because this is actually where the education process actually is helpful to understand what's going on and understand who your customers are. And you learn a lot. Even if the sales are not successful, you still learn a lot. Um, and so just with the first customer, you know, one of the, the tools and tactics um, of just like, I would say, as you get a couple customers in the door, you know, some, sometimes the whole point is actually generating leads. And so there's this role called the sales development rep. And so it's a usually junior person and their job is trying to, you know, once you provide them sort of like a rough outline of sort of like who your potential customers are, their job is to go and like filter and ask questions to qualify and make sure that there's a fit for sort of like what your product does. And once they do, they pass on the lead to you, right? Is this is how you scale. Um, and, and what I think about it just in the beginning is just like your focus is just really getting focused on getting one customer in the beginning, right? Once you get one customer, the, the tip is just sort of like adding a zero, right? Then the next step after you get one customer is go and focus on getting the next 10 customers, right? Once you get 10 customers, then the idea is actually focus on getting the next like 100 customers. So just always add a zero. This allows you to sort of think about growing in a very systematic manner. And, and the rule of 10 of just like, you know, sort of like the business starts to come interesting is when you have at least 10 customers, right? That you've sold yourself and that are like unaffiliated, right? Like these are people that don't know each other that you've just been able to sort of like grow them. Um, so the rule of 10 is just sort of like, that's actually the time when you can start thinking about how you can start building on a sales process and scaling, um, right? And so how do you start building out the sort of like a repeatable sales process? You know, by 10, you should have at least enough of a sample set to build out a sales process. And the way I think about it too, is before you actually go and hire salespeople, after you get the first 10, you actually have to think about more of the retention piece. And so there's a rule called like customer success. It's not just getting 10 customers on board and then paying you. It's actually making sure that they're able to use your product well. So there's an onboarding aspect to this. There is a customer success and account management perspective of just like helping them be successful and using your product that and 10 good case studies. That's, that's what I think the focus is. So always focus on making sure the customer is successful prior to hiring salespeople. Um, so there's a retention aspect to sales. Um, and the next thing is that once you sort of like have been able to get this working, you've gotten 10 customers or more, and you're seeing that they're very successful using your sales pro, you know, using your, your product, you know, when you hire salespeople, um, the way I think about it is that you want to hire two salespeople, right? And not just one salesperson. You want to hire two salespeople. And the reason of the rule of two is by having two people, you can, it's almost like a live A-B test to understand, you know, sort of like where the problems are, right? So it's very, very helpful a lot of times. If you hire two salespeople and they're both not successful, it allows you to ask the question of just like, okay, were they not successful because you know, maybe there's something wrong with the product, maybe there's a sales process issue, or did I hire the wrong people? Um, and, or sometimes what ends up happening, you have one person that's very successful, one person that's not successful, it actually helps you understand sort of like, hey, like, you know, why, what are the reasons that one person is successful and not successful? It helps you figure out whether you, you know, where your problems are. Um, and so this is something I see that's sort of the best practice from Silicon Valley. Um, and scaling part. Um, you know, like in the beginning, you know, like also sort of after you get this sort of working, you want to, you want to sort of like start integrating this with any marketing efforts that you actually have, because, you know, the funnel piece of the sales and marketing are very closely tied together. And so just, it's good to, good to have. Um, and, and other thing is just like, as you start thinking about sort of like selling and expanding into new markets, um, sort of like, how do you cut up the territories? You have to start thinking about these things in the beginning. It's not as important, but over time of just like how you cut up sales, sales regions. So you make sure that salespeople are not fighting each other. Uh, just like they have very, very clearly marked territories to go after. Um, goaling and commissions, you know, you want to make sure you have like very aggressive goals and your, your commissions that you're paying out to your salespeople 
have to be tied very closely also to sort of like these this this goalie. Um, I think once you start getting, you know, once you have like more than you know, like 20 to 30 to 40 customers with the sales process, you have to start thinking about using a CRM. This is a way to allow you to keep track of your pipeline and understand what's going on. Um, and, and tracking sales in the beginning, is just like, you, you know, I think you, in the beginning, you have to want it, you want to do two things, right? You want to track both sort of like the inputs. So like, how are they spending their time? You know, how many folks are they talking with? Um, how many sales calls they're doing, but over time, you also want to be tracking what kind of results are they getting? And the main point about this is just like tracking inputs and outputs allows you to also to fine tune your, your sales process, because, you know, over time, what you should have a good understanding is for every new salesperson, you know, if they do like for every 10 sales calls, they do, they know that they're going to be able to convert at least one customer you know, I don't know that's a number, but every, because every business and every customer is very, very different. But I think over time, you start to be, be able, to, if you track this well, you're going to be able to start being able to build a systematic sales process and understand proper metrics. And so you know that for every hundred sales, you know, for, for, for every salesperson, if they're contacting, say, uh, uh, like an example, like you should know what the basic rules are and what the bare minimum sort of a performance is, knowing that the average salesperson for every hundred contacts that they're reaching out to, for every potential customers that they're reaching out to, they should be able to close somewhere between to convert one to maybe five or 10 customers, you need to have a baseline to compare what is good performance and not good performance. And so the tracking using CRM and tracking this is actually important. And so over time, you should, by doing this, you should be able to build a funnel and understand, you know, timelines on just like, we know sort of how many people need to contact to close sales. We know how long it takes on average to close a customer. And so these are really, really critical pieces to understand. Um, and one of the things that you're going to also understand, you know, sort of like do over time is you're going to have to evolve the type of customer you focus on, right? So in the beginning, it could be sort of, you know, very, very low value per account, but then sort of like over time, as the value goes up, you know, like, do you have to sort of like change your sales approach where in the beginning it might be self-service, maybe over time, you might actually have to build a sales team or the reverse. Maybe you actually end up having a sales team building that piece out and then having to sort of like figure out more of a sort of self-service sort of like model. And so this is something I've seen over time, like the really, really big companies, they do, they service almost all these different types of, of um, customers. And so by understanding that sort of, you will have to evolve your, your sales organization. Um, and so the key, you know, I'm not going to read out the entire uh, quote, you know, but like the idea is just like, if you do this well, right, integrate with marketing, you know, keep, you know, use an SDR, so to keep your sales pipeline full, the whole goal is to sort of have more people to see than the time to actually see them. And this way, you know, like you'll always have like, be able to generate sort of sales. And the, and the key part about sales is really about follow-up, right? And this is why CRM system is helpful. And just like being consistent about following up with your customers or potential customers. This is something, this is a big failure of just like most customers, um, not most customers and most salespeople, they don't follow up enough times. And so, for example, I've read studies as that, for example, for the average con you know, contact, you know, from beginning to end, you might actually have to follow up with the customer seven or eight times before they buy, right? Or even respond to you. And so you have to follow up and be consistent, like, you know, once a week, twice a week, doesn't matter what it is, but just be consistent follow up. And, and over time, building out this process of sales, right? It's a sales process um, as you're building out your organization. In the beginning, that's not as important. But over time, as you're starting to, if you're looking to scale your sales organization, the process piece is actually really, really important. Um, and so to end off, right, you know, there's a great saying in, in sort of like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, that movie, it's ABC, right? It's like always be closing. Um, and so this is kind of the presentation. I think that's it. Yes, I think that's it. So I went through it very, very quickly because I think it's really important to open up for for um, open it up for questions because I'm sure people have a lot of questions. And so, um, hey, guys, do you want me to stop the sharing? How do you want to do? How do you want me to do this? Let's see, Let's see chat. Okay. Yes. All right. Let's feel free to share your questions here. I went through this very quick. I didn't realize that. Um, all right. Anybody have any questions? No questions. Right. 
Hey, hey, kids. Hey, cuz. Yes. Oh, sorry, yes. Marvin. Sorry, 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 sorry. I was, I was on mute. Uh, Marvin, uh, yeah, we have question on Facebook. Okay. So let me, let me raise it. Okay. Let's see. The question is. Yeah. Okay. Here it is. Uh, can you recommend how to contact B2B customers? Sometimes they are difficult to reach. Um, can you give me a little bit more where just like, what's the segment? Is it like large enterprise? Is it like a specific industry sector? Just the nuances is, is helpful. Um, uh, yeah, actually, uh, the, this is uh, one from contacted from uh, looking uh, watching our Facebook live and she's not specifying any details. So, uh, if, if you are, uh, if you are watching us now, please, uh, write in the comments, some more details about the, uh, about the startup and about the segment. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's a very nuanced question, right? Like I, I think that there's lots of ways. Yes. It's very challenging. And truth or matter, sometimes even spamming them. And so like going and like trying to find like a, an email, like LinkedIn is one way, trying to find an email via sort of like just on the website and just like contacting them, even just calling, trying to find the right person at the company. Yeah, it's hard. Um, <laughs> B2B sales is hard. Or you can, some, in the US at least, you can go and buy, um, you can buy databases as well too. But I, I, my take is just like a lot of times you have to just build your own. Um, and a lot of times just using things like tools like LinkedIn or other tools to go and try to find the right contact and contact them and asking them, emailing them just like, Hey, you know, like we're trying to, we understand that you have this problem or like, Hey, we understand that you guys are doing this. And, you know, we have this awesome product that helps you fix this, trying to talk to the right person. Are you the right person? If you're not the right person, maybe you can refer us to somebody, you know, so like, just like you have to go and like find your way through the organization. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for the for answering, uh, Marvin. I will, I will, uh, I will watch the, the, the chat to see whether uh, 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 Katerina will follow up. Here is another question in, in our chat. Uh, so the question is for CRM: Do we need uh, to invest in system software or any tools methodology that we can uh, adopt? Yeah, I, I think it's actually very sort of like there's there's so many great CRM systems, right? I think for most startups, it's usually not Salesforce. Um, you know, like there's like lots of, there's lots of different sort of like relatively easy to use CRM systems. Like there's like Zoho, there's pipe drive, um, you know, like there's like sugar CRM, um, there's affinity, there's close.io. So there's lots of, of sort of like different sort of like CRM systems, HubSpot. And so I think a lot of it's just like going and seeing which one you think is better for your business, right? And that you, you think is easier to use because um, all of them have pluses and minuses. Um, and so that, that's my take. It just like, you kind of just got to check them out, right? Like you got you to gotta view, you know, you got to evaluate them yourself for your business. Thank you, Marvin. Another question from Samuel. Uh, does buying database work? Because I heard that many times the email lists are useless because they end up in spam folder or not attended to. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 would say, I would say it really depends on the industry. So for example, um, like there are some like databases, like for example, for like plumbers or whatever, right? Like taken straight from like associations. And so like, it really depends on the niche. Um, you know, like, so I would say some are very good. Like in general, I think your view is right. Like most databases are usually not very good and it's better to go and just kind of build your own. But I would say some industries um, actually, for example, very, very niche industries and, and some sort of like newsletter sites or whatever actually have like good databases. So a lot of the stuff you have to test yourself and, and it just, it depends. And so I've seen them, I've, I've seen lots of situations where they haven't worked very well. I've also seen a lot of situations where it actually worked pretty good because of the very narrow sort of like focus and they were able to find um, a good source for it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, so another question from Karina Aramian uh, in our Facebook uh, live. Uh, she's saying, I have a ed tech startup and now want to raise seed funding. Is there a minimum amount of customers I need to have? Ad tech or ed tech? Ed tech, education tech. Um, it depends. Well, truth of matters, it depends on, it always depends, right? I think it depends on like, you know, sort of like who you're raising from. Are you raising from angels or VCs? Are you trying to raise like a couple hundred thousand or trying to raise a couple million? A um, little bit of um, nuance would be helpful. 
Okay, Karina, yeah, if you are hearing uh, us and you have some nuances about your edtech startup, particularly the, the, uh, the some some more information about the, uh, the solution, uh, maybe type of the customer you are looking for, that would be uh, like helpful. Please please type in the comment yes. section. Uh, so here is another question in our Zoom chat uh, from Shisher. Uh, hi, thanks for insightful uh, session. Regarding sales, I assume having a company email uh, is profi professional. But for yeah. startups working to get seed funds, is it a good idea to invest in company emails? How important yeah, uh, is it for sales yeah. or acquiring investors? Yeah, the, the, the answer is yes, right? Uh, I, I mean, I just think it's very hard to take you seriously. You have a Gmail account, right? Like you're like, I'm running this business and I have this Gmail account. You're like, it's, it's not that much money to get like a... I don't think, and I've gotten one myself, right? Like it's actually not very much money. It's like 200 bucks a year or something like that, right? To get your own like company and sort of like, like company sort of like email. So yes, I do think it's very, very important. I, otherwise I think like, I think it's particularly in B2B, I think it's hard to take you seriously. Thank you. Uh, another question from Liana there, Abedisa from, uh, from our Abitech cohort. Uh, for sales, we are going to use call centers campaigns. So is there any rules that you can share? I mean, for example, to not disturb the same customers two times during the month, etc. cetera. Um, I, I think it depends on the customer, right? It depends on what the sales cycle is. Like I, I'm of the general view or just like, I think you have to test some of these things to see sort of what makes sense. And so like, I, I think that in the beginning, like, if you're not doing at least like a follow-up like every week, right? Like, you know, like four or five sort of like contacts in a month. I, I don't think like people just are so busy, right? And so I, I don't think there's any rules. I think you have to test it out where it's like, all right, like I'm not going to disturb the customer more than twice. And other, and one, that's one group. And another group, you do almost do like a live AB test. And other one, you, you literally call them like twice a week or something. Um, like, I think you have to test to see what works. Thank you. Uh, Marvin, another question from our Facebook live. Uh, Ira Abajan is asking, what are the top three books to read about sales? Oh, there's so many of them. Um, boy, let's see. Um, the Challenger Sale is really good. Um, yeah, it's called the Challenger Sale. Um, like the sales, the ultimate sales machine is another one that's actually really good. Um, and I also, I'm, I mean, there's just so many really, really good books on sales, challenger sales, uh, the ultimate sales, um, machine. And, um, I'm also a big fan of um, Jason Lemkin's, um, from impossible to in inevitable. Uh, can you please, uh, like after the call, if, if, if you have some links, uh, it would be really useful to share when you post it in our uh, Facebook channel sure. as well. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll for guys, yeah. Uh, yeah, for, for guys uh, that, uh, to, to read us. Uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah. So guys, other, other questions in the in our Avitech group. So uh, you can uh, you, you can type it here, or actually you can uh, even uh, like raise your questions uh, like yourselves as well. So feel free to do that as well. Uh, so another question from Clinton Thomas. Before uh, uh, other folks will think of uh, their questions and raise themselves. So effectiveness of uh, affiliate and influencer marketing as compared to direct social media ads for consumer consumer products. So they're asking about how uh, uh, whether uh, like the affiliate and influencer marketing is more effective or the direct social media ads for consumer for cons yeah, it, consumer it, products. So, yeah. So here, here's my take. I, it really depends on sort of who your customers is and what you're trying to do. Um, and so, like I said, there. You know, I would say generally speaking, though, for B two B, direct social media ads. You know, like yes. Yeah, so okay. Let, let me let me sort of like. Effectiveness of affiliate and affiliate influencer marketing is compared to direct social. I mean, generally speaking, like I think affiliates and influencer marketing, at least in my experience, tends to work better. But like I've seen so many things work, right? And so you just have to test a lot of things. It's very, very hard to go and say this is the only thing that's going to work. And so, um, yeah. and you know, I've seen some companies where direct social media ads tend to work. And actually, in the last two, three months, the, the prices have gone down a lot because there's just not as many people spending money on ads. And so like you're starting to see some good returns now, but I actually think like they all work. A lot of it just is really dependent on your product. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, another question from Nelly Malian. 
Uh, so we are doing sales for more than a year and came across a problem like this. It is extremely important for Armenia to establish close and friendly relations with B2B customers. Yeah. Though oftentimes it proves difficult to manage the balance between friendly partnership and win-win partnership, but customers are becoming too demanding. Can you advise based on your experience? I, I mean, you're going to have, you know, I, I fired customers before because just like even they're giving you a lot of money. I think you have to, you have to, the way I think about this is just like there's a big customer segmentation exercise, right? And so I, I, you know, like sometimes it's a cultural thing. Sometimes there's other things, but I think in general where I think one of the things you always, always want to ask yourself is like, you know, is this worth like all the trouble and pain? Right. And is there a reason why they're being so demanding? Um, you know, like, is everybody like that? If everyone's like that, then there's some questions, you know, like that's then, I don't, I don't know. Right. Like, so there's a larger question and just sort of like, you know, where is that happening? Is it a couple customers only, or is it like everybody? Then it's everybody. That's, that's a larger question. Um, but for me, where like a big part is like understanding sort of like, okay, who are my, what you'll find a lot of times is that if you start segmenting your customers and trying to understand sort of like, who are my heavy users and people who seem very, very happy with my, with my product and, and, and service and understanding sort of like, as you segment out your customers, what you find a lot of times, and, and I do this exercise a lot with my companies where a lot of times when you segment your customers, you find like, wait a minute, the people who are complaining the most are actually the ones not paying us very much money. And so it actually might not be worthwhile keeping them. Right. Or like, let's understand sort of like why they're being so demanding. Is it because like, my product is just not a fit for them. And if that's the case, and then just it's probably better not to go and like work with them. Right. And so just like, I do think like there's a lot of, you have to do, you know, I don't, I just don't know enough about your customers and don't know about your, your business well enough, but I would dig in a little bit more to understand sort of like, if this is everybody, then it's like, okay, then that's probably a, an issue. But my guess is there's probably not everybody. <laughs> Nelly, maybe, maybe you will have some follow-up questions introduce your uh, venture and uh, that 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 would be more insightful for uh, for marvin so the, the floor is yours yeah. so you you feel free to, to jump in yes sure uh, we are doing um, an e-commerce platform for agricultural trade when we connect farmers with b2b customers uh, and food production companies and, and when you say they're demanding, what, you know, sort of like, give me a little bit new, tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, demanding uh, uh, in price negotiations, in terms, payments, and all the stuff. And uh, the, the problem is that uh, uh, when, uh, when uh, you insist on win-win relations, uh, they are kind of starting to manipulate <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, you know, there, there's a larger question, right? For me, where it's like, do they see the value of this? Where I, I'm not saying there shouldn't be any negotiations and, and I haven't done business in Armenia. So I, I, I can't tell you if this is sort of like the, the culture or whatever versus say, for example, I know in China, it is a culture, you negotiate on everything. I don't like it, <laughs> but, but it's just like, well, that's just the way it is. And so, you know, for me, when it's like, you can negotiate to some level, but I, I think it's one of those questions you have to ask yourself. It's like, well, are they negotiating, you know, like, is this just, the, the, the game that they're, that they're playing, or is it sort of like, a, there's a larger question where it's like, okay, then am I really solving a real problem for them? Right. Um, and if I'm solving sort of like, am I solving, so I'm a vitamin or I'm a painkiller for them. And usually for painkillers that like you'll negotiate to some extent, but you're like, no, I need this right now to go and like solve a problem. That's, you know, sort of like really, really urgent for me. And this is a larger question. It's like, okay, then do they see that this is actually a big enough problem? And so maybe the one, the reason is negotiating and just, I'm just guessing. It's just like, maybe they don't see the value of actually what you do, or they don't recognize that this is important enough for them to go and like, you, you know, does that make sense at all? Uh, yeah, probably. Yes. Right? Thank like, you. like it's, it's just like, if this is like, think about like, you know, the, everyone uses the analogy of like the vitamin and the, and the aspirin. Right. And so it's like one of those things of just like, like, if you have a headache, you don't care. A lot of times you actually don't care what price you're paying, right? Just like, I just want this pain to disappear. But if it's a vitamin, you're like, okay, whatever, right? Like I'm going to push as much as I can on this one because like, it doesn't really matter or it's not, I don't see it as critical for me. Yeah. So then uh, the, uh, the uh, like the 
uh, outcome uh, we came to is that from the very start, probably it's not so necessary to be uh, to create those very friendly relations when you can't insist on your position. Because once you get very friendly and uh, then you cannot uh, like uh, insist on your terms. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that, right? Because I think you can be very friendly, but you can still be very firm. Being friendly and being firm, or or you can still do that, right? Where it's like, look, like let's go and try to figure out like how this can be a benefit for you, but we have to also make money too, right? To sort of be able to support you better, right? It's about having margin in my business to properly support you to make sure you're successful. But I can't do it if I'm not making money off this. I, you know, this this business may not be around to support you like two years later on. So I think it's about just it's, you have to be firm about like, you know, how do I figure out something that makes sense for you and makes sense for us? And if it doesn't make sense, if it's only one sided, then that's just not a good relationship. Period. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, are there? Questions for now from, from our cohort, are we the participants, event participants? Uh, uh, Marvin, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Okay. Uh, to yeah, your please. experience, Marvin, uh, who makes better safe per person, uh, men or women? Uh, women, because in Armenia we have uh, such a prejudice that women are not a good salesperson. Uh, just your experience, I would like to know. I mean, I don't. I I think it's almost equal. Some of the best salespeople I know are females and males. So it's like I I think about this one. Like a lot of the people I worked at Yahoo. I'm like, we had a lot of really great female salespeople. We also had a lot of great guy salespeople. So the reality is just like I I've seen both. I don't think there's one better than the other, to be honest. That's a very Thank that's a very that's a very politically correct answer, but like actually, I I don't see any difference. Like I've seen, I know amazing, amazing sort of like female salespeople, just like I know amazing, amazing, um, you know, like guy salespeople. So, you know, I, I'm not sure. I I see. I, I'm not sure there's a difference. Uh, not to be politically correct, but maybe uh, male uh, they are better. Uh, they, uh, maybe something in psychology. I just just wanted to understand if something uh, pure Armenian or you yeah, just uh, wanted to know your experience. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't speak about Armenia, but you know, my experience, at least in most of the world, where like for example, um, like some of the best salespeople, for example, in in Asia, like Taiwan, in China, mm -hmm. like females, like just crushing it. But with, they also had good sales team. Like actually, there's female females who actually ran the sales teams in um, in in Asia, and so I've seen I've seen them all work. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? Hi, Marvin. Hey. Nice to meet you. Uh, I am representing Lubex. Let me tell you shortly what is it. Uh, it's an application which finds any item in the video or image and enables you to buy it instantly. Okay. And uh, I have such kind of question. We have targeted the target market. Our target market is United Kingdom. And we have two options to go to market. The first is uh, to negotiate about 20 uh, B2B partners. So our customers are B2B, uh, are e-commerces who are uh, selling their items. Uh, the, the first version is to go and negotiate with them to collect the initial uh, part of partners yeah. and uh, start the product. And the second one is to uh, scrape their websites to uh, collect the statement and then go to negotiate with them. So what do you think? Which one is better? Honestly, I, I don't know if there's sort of like one approach better than the other. I, I actually think what you do is you A-B test it, right? You know, half of them you go and like, you know, like, here's the thing, you just never know what's going to work or not, right? And so what you do is maybe you split it up in half and half of them, you scrape it and then you approach them and the other ones, you actually just go out and, and talk to them, right? And see which one actually converts better. Um, you just never know. So are you familiar with United Kingdom's uh, culture or not? 
Uh, somewhat. I mean, I, I, I studied there for a short period of time, but I can't say I know it super well. The, the retail culture is very advanced, right? If you think about sort of like the digital spending and, and sort of like just even, even from a retail perspective, even offline, just like the UK market is very sophisticated. Mm. Uh, in terms of like this product, for example, uh, so actually they have like both B2B parts and B2C parts. Uh, which part do you think is better to like concentrate the efforts first? So B2C oh, okay, okay. I, I think yeah. I, un okay, I understand. I, I'm, honestly, um, B2B is a great way, you know, like now I understand your question, right? So first part is B2B, second part is B2C. Is that, is that, was that the question? I thought, I thought you were talking yeah. about sort of work with the same partners and doing one without scraping versus the other. I'm like, okay, now I understand why you give me that weird look. I'm like, okay, now, okay, I understand the question. So B2B versus B2C. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's one approach better than the others. I think in the B2B side, you're, you know, like it's one slower approach to sort of like understand sort of like the, the consumer behavior. Um, I, I find the consumer behavior, learning co about consumer behavior, it's just like way tougher. B2B, at least for me, tends to be a little bit of an easier approach versus a slightly easier, not dramatically easier, right? Um, that's one way to sort of like slow learn um, as you sort of like adopt, right? But um, business to consumer, um, yeah, it's just hard. I think any consumer related stuff is very, very hard. I always find B2B sort of like, generally speaking, when you're doing B2B deals in most countries, like, the nuances, there are nuances in them, but they're not as stark with going direct to consumer. Does that answer your question? Uh, but what do you think? How uh, British uh, e-commerce sites are related to uh, startups? What do you think about startups? If we are startup, just it means we are new, we are uh, without any statement. Uh, is it, it will be hard to connect with them? What's your opinion? I, I, my take is maybe not. I mean, there's so many tools out there, like there's LinkedIn. I also think that if you are solving a real problem for them, like a lot of them, a lot of the e-commerce companies are actively looking for solutions as well too. So I, I do, I don't think it's impossible. I, I think it is totally possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And Marvin, in terms of like investors, uh, uh, so, uh, so for example, it, just you can, you can from, from your perspective, uh, uh, is, is it like for investors, it's more uh, like attractive when a startup is targeting, like is using having the business model like B2B or it's more of a B2C or yeah, uh, how it, they it, are looking on that? Yeah, it, it depends. All right. I think there's a lot of, you know, like the investor base is very, very large. There's some investors that only look at B2C. There's some investors only look at B2B and there's some investors that are journalist investors that look at everything. Right. So there, there isn't one over the other, uh, you know, like the investor landscape is very big yeah and, and you should and, and, and I, I i i never think it's a good idea doing something for the investors like i'm going to do this because investors like this you're dead you're dead in the water if that's the way you're going to run your business right i think you you want to understand what the landscape is like okay like most investors hate consumer right now so i know fundraising will be hard but my customers i can find customers this way then that's is way more important focusing on the customer than focusing on the investor. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, like to generalize also this question, like you as an investor, uh, so uh, you, I guess investors are looking also like some, uh, some characteristics of the like uh, salesperson, for example, in the team or a founder. So what are the key uh, like characteristics of, of a like founder that uh, investors are looking for in terms of like their ability to do the sales, like, which um, is the more important thing in this journey. So I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's one thing. And like every investor is really different. Every investor looks for different things. So I, I know some investors are like, I'm looking for very strong technical founders. Um, and other investors, like I want a founder who's like very commercial. And I think a lot of it actually depends, right? So mm -hmm. for example, it depends on the space that you're in. You know, like I, I would prefer to have, for example, if you're a B2B, I'd prefer to have someone who has like B2B experience, right? Who's, who sold the companies before, who really understand the space versus say consumer. I think it's, it's say you're targeting sort of like teens or social, like I'd want somebody that's probably younger. I think it's, it's, it's much harder for an older person to understand that space. Um, and so it just, it really depends. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So guys, uh, the floor is open for questions. So another question from Clinton Thomas. 
Uh, I have a question on sales spending. Do we uh, have like a lean model to test the channel and the uh, gauge its effectiveness in line with uh, conversions before dedicating a substantial budget to it? Yeah, ab absolutely. Right. Like, uh, you know, you should be testing all the channels all the time to sort of understand sort of what's works and what doesn't work and doubling down on the winners um, because most of the channels and most of the things that you do are just not going to work. And that's just sort of a fact. Right. And so by understanding like, okay, I'm going to try email and even within email, there's a lot of things, right? So what you want to do is maybe in the beginning, it's just like, like there's different ways of doing it. I think there's some words that you pick one, nail it, or you pick one, you're like, focus really hard, doesn't work, and you move on to the next one. But there's also sort of like just, because in the beginning, you don't have a lot of budget, you don't have a lot of time. And so I do think it is important trying like, like one or two or three channels in the beginning, sort of see what works, spend very little, and then you just double down on the stuff that works. And, and so like lean into the things that start to work, right? And dig, you go in more deeply where it's like, okay, like, okay, we see email works really well. Now, how do we make that work even better? So we change messaging, you know, how do we add on sort of like telesales on top of it? And so it's just like over time, it's just like a lot of experimentation. This is why it's hard. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, like uh, uh, Marvin, so this is like basically uh, you are uh, validating your sales channel during the like seed round here, for seed seed, or, or it's something that you need to do like throughout the whole uh, like startup I mean, journey after I, IPO. I, I, I would say it will change over time, right? And because as you open, as you build out new products, you have new customers, it's going to change over time as you go up to new customer segments. But I would say typically by time like series A, you should probably have a pretty good idea of what channels work for you. I hope, right? Like that isn't always the case, but that usually is, that should be the situation. You should have a pretty good idea. And definitely by series B, you should really, you should, you better know what works and doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, don't be shy. Use the opportunity to introduce your project as well. Questions? Well, okay, because if there's no questions, that's okay. Yeah, is this common? Yeah, uh, yeah. Is this common to the online sessions that you, I'm, I'm sure you are you are holding a lot of like uh, this kind of sessions, like start to roll. Um, uh, so, what's the general practice in other countries? Question, Tigran Vazarian. Yeah, please, Tigran. If uh, so, guys, uh, and then also, I forgot to tell like, uh, like uh, the ones who have difficulties in raising question in English, like, feel free to tell it in Armenian as well. I will, I will be happy to translate. So, Tigran, uh, please, your question. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, yes. Um, we had a discussion a couple of days ago with Haikaz and uh, the colleague, and um, uh, the idea um, of a startup evolved around uh, our, uh, the idea of our startup evolved around combining several technological um, uh, know-hows, uh, which are not uh, uh, inno innovative by themselves, but their combination becomes innovative, so to speak. We are speaking about a, where, uh, a greenhouse uh, heating sure. technology. Um, and uh, in relation to that, um, the discussion evolved around that the issue of being innovative enough and being protected, innovation being protected by, by a patent or any other way so that um, the investors uh, have an, uh, have a, uh, are assured over barriers preventing other uh, repeating uh, uh, parties to enter into the, this this area. But um, my question is: uh, Do you think uh, it is really a patenting or in uh, the actual innovation that makes uh, business attractive, 
or it is a dynamics or uh, the, the the momentum the uh, startup should gain to be innovative to be one step ahead of others who try to repeat what they do yeah I, i'm i mean i i come from a software background versus sort of like hardware so i know it's a little bit different but i would say generally speaking for patent stuff i i don't give it too much i i don't care too much about it in general like biotech that's really really important that's everything but like you know usually in, in software and hardware where like it's just there's so many ways to to, to circumvent the ip um, you know, the Chinese are brilliant at this, right? Like, you know, think about like, there's literally companies who are just like, all they do is they watch what is like a bestseller or does well on like Kickstarter. And then they just literally clone it exactly. Right. And, and so I just, I'm not a, I just don't know if like IP is like enough of a barrier. I, I think of it sort of like more of the dynamic sort of aspect of the IP with business model, with sort of like a very specific customers, with revenue and growth and things like all those things, like it's a combination of all those things that make a startup successful. Um, and I think any investor who cares, like, like, is it, and I'm not talking about biotech, but any investor who is like, oh, you have an IP, you have like IP protection. I'm like, well, like I, I just, I was trained not to care about that because it's like, I see lots of academics who like, I have this IP and like, I don't care. Like there's no business model. Like you're not a biotech company, you're software or hardware where it's like all this stuff can be, you know, can be cloned by like, sort of like working around the IP. So it's actually way more important for you to going out there and solving a very specific problem for a customer, right? <laughs> or having some unique business model. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, so um, this, sorry to call. The dynamics, the dy the dynamic and momentum you gain uh, along the way. Well well, well, the dynamic and momentum you're gaining, it means that you're doing something right, right? So that, like that is an evolution of the team, the business model of like, of, of sort of some unique go-to-market approach that, you know, like it's less about like, I think anyone investing in traction is in, is in early stage. Like, I'm like, yeah, so like, great. Like traction is easy to do that. It's actually hard to go and understand what that, like traction is a result of you doing the right things. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, Marvin, Marvin fight. Uh, yeah, 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 fight. I can hear you. So there is another question for in the chat as well. So uh, I will let fight you can raise your question and then I will I will read the question from the chat. Please, can you expand for the or what as a from an investor point of view? What do you? Like, what do you uh, what do you look out when you want to invest in startup? So I, I I you kind of disappear. So like as an investor from investor point of view, what do you? And then I lost you. Okay, what do you look at? What do you look at to invest oh, okay. in this startup? Oh, okay, sure, okay. sure. Uh, the metrics, yeah. the metrics, the metrics you look at. Yeah. Um, I mean, here's the thing. A lot of stuff I invest in don't really have a metric. So I'm looking at sort of like, I'm evaluating the team. I'm evaluating the market. I'm evaluating sort of the proposed business model, um, the customer segment. Um, I'm evaluating them, how they're, they're positioned and their go to market approach versus sort of the competitive landscape. So I'm looking at a lot of different things, uh, from a traction perspective, but just like, I, I kind of depend on who their customer segment is and what the market is. I want to understand, um, you know, like what the, the potential sort of ACV is. I actually want to understand sort of like, um, you know, do they have any customers? Do they have a pipeline of customers? Um, like, it's just, I'm looking at a lot of different things. So I, I don't think there's just one thing I'm looking at. Uh, so, the, so the next question actually is, re is related to metrics. So what is the ideal LTV to CAC ratio for a con consumer product from an investor uh, point of view? So I, I've seen, I, I've seen it range, like I said, depends on the product and situation, but I've seen it like, you know, the highest I've seen is usually like, and I mean, in a bad way, right? Like most of, most of the time is negative, <laughs> but like, you know, I've seen like investors are probably accepting of sort of like, you know, um, you know, like $3 for, you know, spending a dollar for every sort of like, um, you know, like three dollars of, of CAC for sort of three dollars of LTV. That's on the borderline. Um, for me, somewhere between one, you know, one versus four, one versus five is probably about right. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. So, uh, uh, okay, so can you expand more on the team. Um, what can you, um, in terms of balance, um, what are the 
um, requirement um, required um, composition for the same. Like, is it compulsory to have a salesperson or someone in marketing? Oh, you mean for for the CAC? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, yeah uh, I guess I guess she means in in general. What is the ideal composition of Same. the team in, in terms of yeah, having salesperson, I don't know, tech person or stuff like that for an oh. early stage startup? What's the oh, ideal oh. team composition? I mean, my my take is the ideal composition. Although I've seen everything, all different things work. You know, I, my preference, for example, is I like to see sort of, sort of at minimum some of that's really strong on the tech side. And then, and then and sort of paired up with some of the strong on the business side and preferably, you know, like if there's a third person, usually it's that strong on the design side or at least have the design capabilities. It's very rare for someone who's like strong on tech and design, um, it, although it is possible, but like, you know, usually sort of like these three capabilities, I think are sort of like core. Okay. Marvin, and uh, speaking about this, uh, I have actually question so uh, for, for an early stage startup which is just an idea stage and they need to validate the idea and with some MVP uh, so do you think it is okay if there is no for example technology person in the founding team they are business people they haven't like a tech idea for example in AI uh, they uh, have for example some money and want to, want to like try to hire recruit some uh, people in a tech or do some outsourcing do you think that uh, like building the software, like for the for the very early stage for building an MVP, like uh, using outsourcing is, is 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 a good thing to do, what or they mean? they just need to pay attention to the hiring the team member. So what what's what's the balance on that? Um, what do you think? I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. In Silicon Valley, there's a massive bias against outsourcing this early, which I un actually kind of understand. But my take is that if you're really? not playing. So if you're if you're not a planning, Silicon Valley, yeah. If you're not planning on fundraising, then who cares? Outsource it. Like that's nothing wrong with that, right? But it does make me question when, like, I'm like, well, if this is so good. Then why can't you recruit like a good technical person um, as an investor, like fairly or unfairly? But there's a bias against outsourcing this early in Silicon Valley. Doesn't mean it's right, but there's a bias against it. So in, uh, the, the, does, does I, does it, that, uh, did I get right that in Silicon Valley it is, uh, it is like even like encouraged uh, uh, to do outsourcing during the very early stages? No, it's not. It's, it's not it's encouraged. Not, right? it's, 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 not even, encouraged. Like, it's not encouraged. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's what we understand. Sorry to, I want to also ask a question. At what um, stage? Or should one um, get investment after many years as a startup? Look, there, there's no, there's no right or wrong answer, right? Like, there's, like, I, I don't think there's a, there's this path. Everyone has this belief. It's like, okay, I'm going to raise angel money, and then I'm going to raise seed, and then series a and then b c d and but i i i also see a lot of founders who like bootstrap for a long time and then they end up raising like and they're they're, they're private for like four or five years and then they raise money so i have a friend who's like they're doing 65 70 million revenue they're all bootstrapped and now they're fundraising right so like there's just there's no path and some people skip and so it, it's a lot of its personal preference a lot of its market there's just lots of differences and so there's no one path i think the key point that out of all this stuff i'm saying is that there's no one way of doing stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in that case, like when, when people, when they managed, for example, bootstrap their president seed rounds. So, uh, so uh, what's that? Uh, if, for example, they are, uh, they are coming to the investors for the series A, is it, uh, are they more attractive for the investor or, or it doesn't, uh, or it doesn't matter? Investors, they don't really. Yeah, it, 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 that, could, that. it could actually be the case they're more attractive because they're like, the cap table is intact. And yeah. they've shown that they've been able to grow without raising a lot of money. Like that's, these are all good things. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but, and, and in terms of like the reason that, uh, are the investors care about the reason why they bootstrap? So I mean, I mean that for example, when startups raise, they, they are eager to, if they could uh, grow like while bootstrapping in one year, they may grow like uh, with the raising money in, in half in a year. So does yeah, it true, maybe. first of all, or, and, or, or like investors are, are taking care of like that kind of question, so it doesn't matter for them at all. It's uh, I mean, like, here's the thing, right? Just like, I don't think there's like, I don't think investors are judging or it's like maybe like they had a hard time fundraising or maybe they just like, 
like, I don't know. Sometimes that's a question. Like, sometimes that comes up. But my take is just like, I, I think good investors don't really care. Ultimately, it's like your business is growing. You decide to bootstrap it. That's awesome. And so now it's just like they care more about the future than what you did before, right? Like where it's like, okay, great. Like, like and bootstrapping is like, there's nothing wrong with it. It means like they've been able to grow more capital efficient. Like, like and it isn't always a case you raise money, you grow faster. That's the concept in theory. More likely, I have lots of companies that raise tons of money and go nowhere. And I have lots of companies that raise tons of money and it takes them like, like way longer to raise the next round because they got stupid and, and used the money wrong. Mm -hmm. um, that's more frequent. Yeah, actually, it's like a follow-up question to that. The, how, how startups can understand how much actually to raise? It's, it's very early round. For example, they are doing their prestige round. They, they, they have a prototype. They have want to finalize their MVP and like have some like uh, go for some product market fee like how to understand how much to raise for that round for them to be like not be diluted a lot and also not the over uh, over raise and 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 don't how to use the money so how what's the for, is there a formula or if there's, not, there's no real formula i mean just you have to go and figure out like where where you think the business is going to be like a year from now what's that milestone and then work backwards or based on let's i'm making up the number say you want like okay we're going to be at a million dollars and 10 customers. So that's going to be my goal, like one year from now. So if, if that's one year from now, what do I need to do for that? How many salespeople I'm making up, or how many salespeople do you need to hire? How many engineers do you need to hire to go and build out to sort of get to that point? And so then that's how you decide how much you raise, right? And then you add on, like, I know it's going to cost me that. So I'm going to add on six months or even a year because I know I'm going to make some mistakes. So my milestone is a year from now. And then a year afterwards, I'm going to go and figure out sort of like what I like, then I'm going to add some buffer. Like that's how you figure out how much you want to raise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question in our football lab, but actually I cannot really get the question. So let me read that to see whether we can. Uh, my question is about crowdfunding. How can a startup from a country where many crowdfunding organizations are not based raise funding? I don't really get that, that question. But I assume. Uh, uh, yeah. I assume so it's a question. question. About, yeah. It's a question about crowdfunding, right? So the question is just like, how do I get on Kickstarter or what's the other one called? Um, like uh, in Diego. Indiegogo, yeah, Indiegogo. Um, honestly, I, I mean, I don't have a ton of experience with crowdfunding in general. Like, I have some companies who've done it, but they, they're usually sort of like as part of like a larger fundraise, and they're usually mm -hmm. hardware products, you know, very rarely software products, or where mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of like crowdfunding. So, I don't know if I have a lot of experience in the last couple of years in this area. And uh, Marvin, how do you, like uh, follow on investors looking at uh, startups who did like equity crowdfunding and they are a bunch of people in the cap table? So, is it is it is it a, is it a bad sign or uh, well, again it doesn't care? Well, the thing with the, the thing with crowdfunding is that it's usually consolidated under one you know like they're usually consolidated under sort of like one line on the cap table, so that's not that big of a deal. And I think if you're a consumer focused uh, company, doing crowdfunding is okay because a lot of times they're they're your customers. So I think it just really depends. But I, I think like crowdfunding, as long like I think it's okay. But a lot of it is also really dependent on your space. A lot like usually hardware, it's okay. Like that's expected because uh, that's sort of how you get your first couple customers. Really, yeah. yeah, yeah. But so so investors are, are, are they don't have any like specific uh, like view uh, whether the startup did crowdfunding or or, or, or didn't. And it's, it's every every investors. every investor has a different view. But my take is I don't know if it's that big of a deal. Great, 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 great. Thank you very much. Guys, any other questions? If not, actually, we can summarize uh, today's session. Uh, so, Marvin, thank you again uh, for uh, being part of the yeah. Tech program uh, as well. So, so you are with us like already like one year. And we're very hopeful that uh, our like collaboration, we can uh, we can expect your uh, guidance and advice during the upcoming years uh, as well. Uh, and uh, like uh, in the end, we will have uh, like startups who will be even interest of your portfolio. Uh, they will be like as advanced uh, to take an investment from the Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and, and we can be also somehow useful for you for your portfolio and for your. 
uh, for your initiatives. So thank you very much uh, from the program, uh, from the face of Fast. Uh, thank you once again for uh, being with us. Uh, we are always happy to see you uh, here and we are looking forward actually to see you in person. Uh, and we very much hope that uh, at least like next year we will, the all borders will be open the virus we can so too. And you will yeah we will have chance to host you here uh, yeah, and 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 and, 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 uh, and introduce our startup ecosystem our country uh, and uh, have your insights about everything that's going on in that space cool. so thank you very much thank you very much for having me thank you thank you marvin thank you yeah yeah good luck Thanks everyone so thank Take you care. so much thank you Thank you very much.